Hello, my name is Katie Valenta and today I'm talking to Emerita Professor of History Desley Deacon. This interview is being recorded on the 14th of January 2013 in the ANU Media Studio as part of a summer scholar program hosted by the ANU School of History and supervised by Paul Arthur. The media producer is Jamie Kidston. Desley, thank you for being here today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Good, yeah. Um, so you started your career in the public service um, before you went into academia and you spent a number of years there. What experiences of your time in the public service um, do you most value now or did you value throughout your career? Well, first of all, it gave me a job um, because uh, when I finished my honours degree in 1963 um, in Queensland, um, graduates really had to go somewhere else in order to get a job and um, Canberra was offering this uh, very interesting sounding um, administrative training scheme which was a new almost a pilot scheme um, so having a job was great um, then I think it gave me enormous self-confidence um, because it was a, uh, a new program that was bringing um, graduates into the public service for the first time. It seems incredible now, but that was the case. Uh, so we were an experimental group. There were 12 of us uh, and uh, everyone wanted it to go well. So we had uh, the best, um, they were all men, of course, the mentors, but um, they, would, they were really keen for it to go well and uh, they were wonderful mentors and uh, had this great group of um, this cohort um, which uh, has been a very important part to me. Having, having a good cohort was a, has always been a very important part of my career. So um, everything was set up to make you feel good uh, uh, and also to teach you really useful skills. I mean that, that was the whole purpose of it to fast track you into the higher echelons of the public service. So, um, I mean, apart from the self-confidence and the, the learning about the importance of mentors and cohort, et cetera, et cetera, I learnt really useful skills like uh, report writing. Um, um, the head of the public service board then was Sir Frederick Wheeler, uh, who was famous as a sort of fierce Oh, uh, um, I mean, in terms of making you do things right. And um, he would never accept a report that was longer than one page. So you really had to learn to write well, be mm. concise, etc., etc. So I learned a lot of those sorts of skills. Mm. You, were, you were one of the only women in, in um, your graduate program at the time, weren't you? What was, what was that like? Uh, yes, there were two women mm. uh, out of the 12. Um, and, um, well, it was great. Uh, it, it was a very interesting time. This is 1964. Um, it seemed to be a moment of change for women who wanted to have careers. Mm. And the, um, the, the young men who were associated with it um, all had that same mindset that yes women were going to be part of their world and um, so it was just good fun and mm. uh, as well as um, having having their support mm. yeah at the same time you know although things were changing there was obviously still the marriage bar in place so so when you um, when you got married you had to to cut your time back. How did you feel about that at the time? Yes, I got married the, fine, the, the, the next year. Um, so I'd been in the public service 18 months then. And um, the marriage bar was in a funny sort of uh, um, position at that time. Everyone knew that it was going to disappear the moment that Menzies, I can't remember whether he had to die or, or retire, but everyone knew that it just depended on his health, as it were. Um, and the, uh, the mentors in this program just acted as if the marriage bar was not going to exist. And it did still exist when I got married and I had to then become a temporary employee. 
But nothing changed about the level of work that I was doing, the level of support that I got from the higher ups and my colleagues and everything. And um, the, 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 the thing that actually interrupted my career was that I'd married someone from foreign affairs and we got posted abroad. Mm. Um, and, but, uh, and by the time I came back, the marriage bar had disappeared. And uh, just to give you a sense of the sort of support that I had, um, every time we came back from postings, my job would be there for me again. Mm. Uh, so, uh, and it wasn't until about 10 years later when things uh, had changed significantly in the public service that that job was no longer there. Mm. And that's when I went into academia. Right. Yeah, well, I'd like to talk about um, your transition into academia. Um, you've written a couple of times about um, creating this network of female scholarship in order to kind of support each other and, and um, you know, create this mentoring system. Um, have mentors been important in, in shaping your career and your life more generally? Um, yes, but not in any overt sort of way. Um, I might add um, that probably my first major mentor uh, was a man mm. uh, and that was the man that I later married um, that I uh, um, obviously after I was divorced um, from my first husband um, but um, I worked for him as a research assistant and um, he gave me every opportunity to be a full-fledged member of the group that was um, researching and writing that book and um, eventually um, gave me joint authorship of the, uh, of the book. Um, but he just treated me as if, okay, here's a smart woman. Um, she works hard. Uh, she could do, she should be doing as well as, as possible. Um, so that was really important to me. Um, um, but um, at the same time, this is the mid, uh, let me think, where are we? Um, oh, the late, where are we? No, uh, mid 70s. Yes, yes, yes sorry. Yeah, <laughs> Hard to think back. Yeah. Um, when uh, feminist scholarship was really getting underway mm. um, uh, and uh, the uh, and Anne Curthoys had just come to the ANU to set up the uh, women's studies program. There were um, lots of feminist scholars, most of them around the same age or a little bit older than me. And um, so I think rather than mentors, they were cohorts. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that was tremendously um, boosting to your self-confidence. You, you, you sort of knew that you were um, onto a wave and that, that there were people who thought what you were doing was really interesting. Um, and um, we would get together to talk about what we're doing and there were beginning to be conferences with women's studies uh, sections in them. So um, again, there's, there's that support that I, mm. that I had then, which was very important throughout my life. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I mean, by the same token, have you, have you tried to kind of cultivate that for um, younger scholars? Have you oh, tried to? Oh, definitely, yeah. definitely, yes. I mean, I see, I've always seen that as a very important role of uh, now, once you're in any sort of position where you can influence policy or recruitment or just helping um, students get their PhD done, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. um, that's always been a very important role for me. 
Yeah. So obviously, you said your your main mentor um, was, in fact, a, you know, a male. Yes. Um, do you think that male academics generally can play an important role in the inv advancement of women in in academia and in, you know, creating a more egalitarian scholarship? I think th I think they can. And in my and in my experience, I had a lot of good male friends and mentors mm -hmm. in academia. But I've seen some. Um, times where where it can go wrong, ways in which it can go wrong. Um, not to me, I haven't experienced this personally, but I've seen males who s think that they're mentoring and they call it mentoring and they're actually using that um, um, person in getting them to do the parts of their job that they don't want to do the menial <laughs> exactly yeah. yes yes and I mean it's it's a um, two-way um, street for the for the woman who's being mentored because she does get to learn a lot of skills because she's doing <laughs> this guy's job while he's doing something yeah. else um, and these they off the men often have the influence to um, get that mentoree a good job afterwards, um, but it's always seemed to me to be not the way I would want to uh, get on in my career. Mm. Um, so you sort of have to be careful, yeah. um, and I think that. Um, if there are formal mentoring programs, that these, that the mentors need to be trained uh, and to be watched, mm. um, because it, um, it can go. Of course, women could act in this sort of way too, as what I call poor mentors, but. Um, and, um, there's, there's, there can be problems. Yeah. So um, you've been a teacher, a researcher, and a high-level administrator. Um, what have been some kind of memorable turning points in your career, or you know, moments when you've really felt you've exerted an important influence over your field or your university? Right. Um, apart from my research, you mean? The, no, oh, including oh, in, your research. Oh, okay. Well. Um, I think in my research, um, funnily enough, the very first article that I published, which was the first chapter of my thesis, um, was about the way that um, married women workers were recorded in the, in the census. Uh, this is a historical article. In fact, this was what turned me from sociology to history, that uh, I started looking at the censuses and saw that there were major differences in the way that married women's work was recorded. And um, I um, wrote about that, basing it on the um, Australian censuses, or actually the, um, I mean, it started in the 19th century, so it was the colonial censuses and then uh, getting into the uh, Australian censuses in the early 20th century. Um, and that was something that Australian economic historians just had actually ignored. I mean, they they knew that the material was there, but they didn't think it was important. Um, and so, um, uh, so I, the article was based on the uh, Australian censuses, but it was published in the. Um, U.S. feminist journal Signs, which was the great place for feminists. That's where everyone wanted to publish at, uh, at that time. Um, and, and it had quite a large influence throughout the world, uh, an enormous number of studies of this sort of issue have been carried out uh, in just about every country of the world now. So I, I, I feel very proud, mm. <laughs> proud of that one. Um, I, um, so I guess that's probably what I think my major single contribution has been to research. Um, t 
teaching. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't think I've made any major contributions there. Although I think that I've been a good teacher and and uh, and a good um, uh, PhD supervisor. But I don't think I did anything unusual in that. Um, in administration, um, my first major um, admin job was as Director of Women's Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. Mm. And that is a huge university. It's um, something like 35,000 students were there at the time that I was there. And um, <coughs> one of the things that I was able to do was to um, div extend the program so that it went across all sectors of the community. So we included engineering, science, um, uh, management, uh, you know, the, not just the humanities. And um, that was quite an experience doing that. Mm. Um, uh, at the ANU, um, I was um, uh, head of the department for various periods between when I came back here in 2001 and when I re retired at the end of 2009. And um, the two things that I feel very proud of there are, first of all, the establishment of the Indigenous History Centre, um, and um, uh, which wasn't my, uh, I mean, I didn't, I wasn't the original conceiver of the idea. Barry Higman, my colleague in history, was the person who who started the ball rolling on that. Um, but I was the one who had to bring it into being and recruit the the staff and um, get it get it going. And um, so I was very pleased to be able to get Anne McGrath as the director of that and um, and a number of Indigenous scholars, uh, Gordon Briscoe, who was the, um, I think, I think he's the first um, Aboriginal to get a history PhD, which was in our program before wow. my time. Um, but he was one of the first uh, people to be cr recruited to the new program. And um, 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 Francis Peters Little, um, who is uh, amongst her, all of her own accomplishments, is the daughter of Jimmy Little, the great Australian singer. Yeah, wow. Uh, and um, she arranged for Jimmy to sing at our at the inauguration of the centre. So that was that was a great moment. Um, the uh, the other thing that I, I feel very proud of is to. Um, um, bring the uh, Australian Dictionary of Biography back into the history program and to extend it, uh, its um, scope to turn it into uh, the National Centre of Biography, which is uh, our hosts mm. <laughs> today. So this is some of the fruits of, uh, of that extended um, ADB. Um, but one of the things I'm really proud of is seeing the ADB flourishing and extending its uh, the work that it's doing in all sorts of interesting ways today. Mm. On the topic of biography, yes. some, of, some of your major works have been um, biographies. Has has writing biographies of eminent women kind of um, influenced your life in any way? Have, has it made you um, think about your own life in a different way and how you might be remembered or thought of in the future? Yes, well, uh, my the first biography that I wrote was of the American anthropologist and feminist Elsie Cluse Parsons. And um, she was a, a, a very unusual and um, courageous woman. Um, and the reason I was attracted to her in the first place was that I saw a picture of her on the front of a book about uh, pioneering women social scientists. Um, and she was sitting there uh, with a little baby on her lap. And all of the others in the picture I knew were women who were unmarried. This is 
sort of 1890s. Um, and I thought, oh, that's an interesting woman. Uh, I'd like to know more about her. And uh, it turned out that she was um, um, what I call in one of my articles about her a practical anthropologist in that she was interested in the ways in which you could change the way societies acted, um, particularly about race and gender. And um, she was particularly courageous in her own life. She always felt that she had to put it, well, she put into practice her theories. Mm. And uh, I just, uh, as is ob probably obvious from the book, I just fell in love with Elsie. <laughs> and um, uh, for many years afterwards, uh, if I was in some sort of personal dilemma, I'd say, now, what would Elsie do? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, she's had a big influence on, on my life. Mm. Um, um, the, the biography that I'm working on at the moment on the Australia-born actress, Judith Anderson, I don't know that I've learnt so much from her, but um, I've, I've been very... I've, how can I put it? Um, it's the. F I'm, I'm basically writing a, a, a book about a celebrity, yeah. and uh, I've I've real I've come to realise how difficult that job is and how poorly it's usually done, mm. um, and so I'm I'm very keen in that to show uh, Judith Anderson as this terribly hard working career woman. Yeah. I mean, we tend not to look beyond the celebrity whose photograph is in the New Idea or the Woman's Weekly uh, and, and not think of all the tremendously hard work that that person is, mm. has put in and is putting in to, uh, to have that career. Yeah. They tend to be quite flat characters. They know? do, yeah. yes, yeah. 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 Um, well, I want to I want to talk some more about um, your role, uh, your your ideas about women in academia and in life life generally. Um, one of the one of the quotes you included of um, in your biography of Elsie Clues Parsons um, mentioned that she thought that the internal tyrannies of social conventions were more restrictive than the external tyrannies of of political and economic um, restrictions. Do you think, um, obviously she was writing it at the beginning of the 20th century, do you think that's still true at this point? Um, or do you think um, that external tyrannies are, are more oppressive? Or do you think that those have just changed? Well, I, th I think that you just get rid of one lot and another lot <laughs> mm. come in. Uh, and I'm not sure what those tyranny, internal tyrannies are for young women today, um, but sort of from, from the distance that I'm looking at it. Um, one of the things that I notice is um, a tremendous emphasis on being a good mother um, in all sorts of ways that uh, can't help but be restrictive to um, doing anything else. Um, I mean, I'm quite horrified when I read about uh, uh, young mothers being advised to um, feed on demand or feed every two hours. I mean, there's no way that you can get anything done <laughs> um, while, uh, while you're on that sort of regime. Um, I mean, I, th I think if there was any advice I was going to give to young women starting out in a career today, it would be to shape your child rearing in ways that help your career. I, and, and that doesn't mean neglect. Mm. It means... Um, strategy. Strategy, <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, and one of one of the things that I found when I had young children myself um, was that it was actually very good having young children. I, I'm talking here about school age, young school-aged children. Um, 
because you had six hours. They went to school at nine o'clock and they came home at three. You had to do your work in that time. It made you very uh, efficient. You didn't mess around. <laughs> uh, you got on with the job. And uh, the hours that you spent with the children were um, sort of enforced re relaxation. I mean, to talk about uh, looking after children as relaxation, but I think that if you don't have that sort of enforced relaxation, you can work around the clock and that's not necessarily good mm. for you. It's good to have some relaxation. Mm. Um, you've talked a little bit already about um, your time at ANU, your, your greatest achievements um, while you were here in, in, the, in the early 2000s. Um, mm. what, I, I know that that was also a time of kind of great structural, um, you know, a structural shift at yes. ANU. What were some challenges around that oh. time? Because you were head of history for, for some time there. Well, uh, and I, I just felt that that entire period from 2001 till uh, the end of 2009 was just one major change after the other. Um, so just keeping up morale uh, and, and also keeping up um, you, your publication, your work. Um, th there seemed to be so much um, anxiety in the air all the time. Um, it, it, it changes would be mooted and um, you'd just get your head around that and, oh, that's not going to happen anymore. There's going to be this other sort of change. Um, it made me think... Uh, uh, that if I was the head of an organisation, which I wasn't, um, and so I probably shouldn't be criticising, but I think it, if you're going to do major change, you need to do it in a short, sharp way. Don't let people suffer mm. for years. Okay, if you're going to sack people, sack them. Uh, don't let them worry for two or three years as to whether they're going to be sacked. Mm. Um, so... Um, so, w but you were asking about what I could do about it. Uh, well, I and mean, yeah, what what were mm, you know challenges? Obviously, it was it was it was. It sounds like it was quite challenging. But yes, um, I'm not sure. Um, uh, I think just keeping up morale is yeah. a really important. I mean, keep keep people as informed as possible, mm. um, and. This isn't anything that I did that was different from what other heads of departments might have done. Um, but uh, we used to have regular monthly meetings uh, where we would discuss all mm. these sorts of things. Uh, keep people informed, um, try and keep up the morale and, yeah. and, and mentoring type um, ways. Mm. Um, it's interesting mm. to, to hear about that time because I know you also, you did your PhD at ANU, so you have kind of a, a unique experience of having been here in, in the 80s and then coming back, you know, 20 years later. Um, were there quite uh, obvious kind of cultural or intellectual differences between those times or do you think it's kind of remained pretty much the same? Oh, no, it's totally changed. Yeah. Um, but, um, of course, uh, in the 80s, the early, mid mid seventies, early eighties, when I was here um, as a first as a research assistant, uh, then as a tutor and a, um, um, a postgraduate student. Um, I mean, I didn't, I wasn't really conscious of what was going on in the higher echelons of the university at that time, in the way that I was in when I came back in mm. in the early. Um, 21st century, yeah. <laughs> um, but um, w changes that that I could compare. Um, first of all, uh, the enormous um, increase in the number of women in uh, as in professorships and um, leading administrative roles in the university, um, and that's been particularly the case in history. Uh, which I think has one of the best records at the ANU in terms of 
um, gender equality. Um, so that's an enormous difference. Uh, and, and along with that came um, the topics of, of research. Uh, I mean, the, and, um, practically nothing was done on women or gender um, in the, that was just all beginning in the mid 1970s and now it's a standard part of uh, any uh, research has to take in those um, those aspects of of life um, and the other big change of course is is race um, I mean there was just practically no work done mm. on race at uh, at that time and now it's uh, uh, absolutely integral part of, yeah. of any research project. Mm. Um, well, just finally, um, if you could speak to yourself as a young woman at the beginning of her career, um, is there anything that you think would be valuable to share with her? If, 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 you, if you could say one thing to a young Desley Deacon, what would you say? Well, um, I, th I think what someone did say to me uh, is uh, what I think was very valuable and one that I would want to pass on to um, younger scholars now. Um, when I f first, um, uh, when I was first contemplating doing a PhD, um, because my undergraduate work had been in English uh, and I was wanting to do a PhD in sociology, I had to do a year um, um, you know, doing some sociology courses. And the first essay that I wrote, um, the professor, George Zabriskie, um, uh, was, was my teacher in that class. And uh, I was very crestfallen because I only got a 74 for it and so I didn't get a, uh, a distinction. Um, and so I went to see him about this and um, he said to me, Desley, you've got to be bold. And I think that's the best <laughs> advice that I ever got uh, from anyone. And um, so if I was, uh, I don't know that there's any advice that I'd give to the young Desley uh, because I've, I feel as if everything came very naturally uh, to me, that it was a, and I think I've been very lucky, um, it was a combination of the times which were just right for, for me and what I wanted to do and my particular personality and interests and, and skills that just seemed to come together and rode a, a wave. Um, and so I don't know what advice I would give to <laughs> to younger scholars, but uh, because there's there's a lot of luck in all of this that mm -hmm. that you're just the right person for the, for the right time. And um, but but I do think uh, be bold, um, have self confidence in your own ideas. Um, I'd also say. Um, um, be a good friend because uh, those friendships are really very important um, and fight your fight but don't make enemies mm. so that's Great. I think that's what I would that <laughs> sums up what I would it's say all excellent advice <laughs> thank you well thank you very much for coming in today it's been a pleasure to have you thank you Katie I've enjoyed it very much